Okay, hi, hello everyone. Um, welcome to our book launch this evening. Thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Jasmine, I'm from Carcanet Press. Um, I'm very pleased that you can all join us tonight. Um, we're celebrating the publication of a very special book, um, Last Poems by Thomas Kinsella. Um, brand new collection includes some posthumously po published poems for the first time um, from the late Thomas Kinsella. So thank you for being here. Um, we're doing things a bit differently tonight. If you've been at our launches previously, um, you might be sort of used to how we do things. But this evening we're joined by a whole host of readers. Um, so um, we are going to hear from um, editors at Carconet Press, John McAuliffe and Michael Schmidt. Um, they're going to introduce the book and introduce the event properly in a second. And then we're going to have some poetry readings. Um, they will come from John and Michael. And we've also got Mary O'Malley here, Gerard Smith, Andrew Fitzsimons, who um, has sent a video. I'm going to hopefully, fingers crossed, play you in a bit. Um, Gerald Daw and Adrienne Levy. Um, so I'm very pleased that they're all joining us tonight as well. Um, as usual, we will be having some audience questions. If you have any questions you want to put to any of our readers or speakers later on in the event, please do find the Q&A button. Um, it's separate from the chat button, so please do find that if you've got questions for anyone and pop them in there. Um, please do also find the chat, say hello to us, um, let us know what you think of the reading, let us know where you're watching from. We'd like to hear from you as we go through the next hour or so together. Um, and finally, I want to say thank you for paying to be here. We really appreciate your support, obviously. Um, there is a discount code for you to buy a copy of the book. I've put it in the chat for you, um, but we'll go over all of that later uh, again. So I think um, that that's all the technical stuff. I'm going to invite John and Michael on screen to join me so we'll get going. Thanks very much, Jazz. Um, so I'm going to uh, start things off tonight with a few introductory words. And as Jazz said, um, please do um, pop your uh, name into the into the chat and let us know um, where you're joining us from tonight. It's always one of the great joys of these Zoom events to be able to see the kinds of groups that gather together from all part corners um, of these islands. Um, to 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 listen to um, to listen to new poems and and some old poems tonight. So um, I, my name is John McAuliffe. I'm associate publisher here at Carcanet, and um, I worked with two of our readers here tonight. Um, and also on on a manuscript, I suppose that Jerry Smith, another of our readers, is also very involved um, in putting together over the last um, number of years. So we're delighted to have Jerry and Adrian Levy and Andy Fitzsimons as well. Um, the other people I'd like to just mention at the outset are um, Tom's daughters, Mary and Sarah, who were such a help in terms of preparing the text and supporting us as we were able to put this book together um, over the last year or so. So this book, um, and here it is, um, is comprised of um, an earlier book called Late Poems, which Carcanet published in 2013. Um, and that itself was a collection of five of the um, famous pepper canister sequences but in the new book, there's also a set of new poems that he was working on in his last years. And that final set of poems is itself a fascinating collection because it's comprised of complete new poems and um, some fragments, some recovered early work and um, from right at the beginning of his writing life, including poems um, that he published in the National Student from his time at UCD. Um, we're going to hear poems from right across the book um, later from an array of readers who, like me, have known and loved Thomas Kinsella's poems, um, really from the start of my reading and my writing life. Um, and I thought I'd say a word about that before I hand over to Michael. And um, I think that for readers and for writers of my generation, um, Thomas Kinsella's greatness um, as a poet is also associated with our first acquaintance with his work, because we often first met him in the school anthologies, and I'm sure that's the case for many people um, who, who have read, uh, who'll be here tonight as well. And to read his poems in a school anthology was just so electrifying to find such a modern vice, voice, and a voice that was so obviously so intelligent and so rational um, in how he was putting his poems together. Um, then at university in Galway, I, I went on to read the pepper canister sequences and his still astonishing and unsurpassed translation of the Tawn. Um, those poems changed my mind about poetry and they certainly changed many other minds too about Irish poetry and about what modern poetry could do. Um, in the sequences and in this late work, um, Kinsella seems to have found a style which is 
adequate to the intelligence of his thinking um, and the range of his interests. Um, in last poems, there's there are sequences about war, um, about faith, um, about love and about age and illness as well. And in all of those poems, I think what's remarkable, um, and I think we're going to hear this tonight, is how they're asked to be equal to other ways of writing about them too. So the poems are asked to sit alongside what a scientist might think or what an anthropologist might think, and to hold their own as a way of communicating to people about things that really matter. So um, having said all this kind of generally about the poems, I'm, I'm now going to ask um, Michael Schmidt, um, Thomas Kinsella's publisher for um, 20, 20, 20, more than 25 years um, now, um, to talk a little bit about how important uh, and crucial um, Thomas Kinsella's work has been for Karkinet and how he first came onto the list. Michael. Thank you very much, John. Yes. Um... Thomas Kinsella came to Carcanet through PN Review, our magazine. He started contributing to PN Review in 1993, both as an essayist and as a poet. Um, his first major essay was entitled W.B. Yeats, The British Empire, James Joyce, and Mother Grogan, evidence of his wonderful, but not always present sense of humor. Uh, this was followed by a piece entitled Origins of Anglo-Irish. So you have a balance of tones and obviously a balance of themes. At the same time, uh, we were publishing his poems, uh, again from 1993, the first poem being In Memory, a wonderful elegy. In the end, we ran 21 of his poems, uh, the two major essays that I just mentioned, and five shorter uh, prose uh, pieces, and a substantial interview uh, in 2018 with Adam Hanna. Thomas Kinsler was himself first reviewed in PN Review by Lawrence Sale in 1990. So he, he was already a presence to our readers in that sense. Many reviews of his work followed, notably in 2008 by none other than my associate, John McAuliffe. Uh, it was among his earliest contributions to a journal which he now co-edits with me. Um, the first book that we published by Thomas Kinsella was The Dual Tradition. We didn't come in on this poem to, poetry until later. That came in 1995. Um, it was about the cohabitation within one culture of two languages, two contrary and sometimes conflicting, sometimes complementary histories. And oddly enough, this very morning, we received an offer for translation rights for this book from Spain, a country where similar cohabitations of languages occur, especially perhaps Catalan and Spanish. When we took over the Oxford University of Poetry, his poetry and that of Charles Commons, who were my very chief quarries uh, when we acquired the list. Both were poets I discussed at length with my close friend and mentor, Donald Davy. At one time, Davy had been a very close friend of Thomas Kinsella's. Together, they explored and very differently combined the legacies on the one hand of Auden and on the other of Pound. And this was another dual tradition, if you like. Auden and Pound representing such contrary and yet at times such complementary forms of each frequently outspoken. Donald Davy and Thomas Kinsella enjoyed a profoundly creative friendship, which was a casualty of an unfolding colonial history. It saddens me that they never mended their friendship because for each of them, in formative terms, it had been so valuable. I believe. I think Donald Davy knew this, and perhaps Thomas Kinsler did as well, that they helped shape one another, and that their eventual absence from one another was damaging to each of them. Both were defined and emphatic individuals, and their arguments had been productive until the wedge of politics or history split them apart. What I love about Thomas Kinsler in particular is the prosody of his poems, the way he handles lines and paces them, and how from pound, he had developed the most disciplined freedom, a respect for semantics, for syntax, and how it can be obeyed and disobeyed. And the way that underlying each surprise, each unpredictability, an expectation has been created and then redirected or deliberately misdirected. This is an insight that, uh, that I shared with me by Christopher Middleton. I only met Thomas Kinsler a very few times, though we corresponded quite regularly for about a dozen years, sporadically thereafter, uh, in part because of email, a medium which came to dominate my communications in an unhealthy way. 
Um, a lot of my friendships with older writers loosened at that time. Uh, the postage stamp became to me an anachronism, and I'm afraid that has remained the case. Thomas Kinsella is with Ivan Boland, the contemporary Irish poet I most value, learned from, and rejoiced in publishing. I learned a lot from him and from his otherness, uh, his humor that I mentioned, and his savage, very un-British ironies, how one lived in one's history rather than through it. It was a joy to read the later poems uh, brought together by his daughters and friends and edited for us by them and by John McCormick. And it's a real joy to have this book in front of me now. And I want to hand over now to Jerry Smith. <clears throat> Jerry is the poetry editor of the Irish Times, of all Anglophone newspapers, the one with which, uh, with which I'm familiar, the one that has most unbrokenly and firmly committed to the art of poetry. The reviews there can be negative, they can be positive, but they always remain critical. And that criticism creates a creative space. Uh, not only Irish poetry is reviewed there, uh, Jerry is uh, a, a great encourager of poetry from around the world and readership is developed by the foreign poets that get reviewed there as well. Jerry is a great familiar of Thomas Kinsella's Dublin, its streets, its noises, its smells, and its textures. The Dublin we find so often in these poems, poems which I think Jerry knows better than anyone else because he, he helped to, uh, to, as it were, work with Thomas in his closing years. Anyway, can I hand over to you now, Jerry? And I'll, I'll turn myself off. Sorry, I'll repeat myself. Thank, thank you, Michael, for, for the introduction and those insights into your 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 long relationship with Tom. Um, I suppose I, I'll begin on a personal note before I go into the poem, if I may. Um, I, I, I first met Thomas Kinsley in my local library in in the 1960s when I was still a schoolboy. Um, <clears throat> on the page, of course. And not knowing then, not having any notion that we would form a friendship much, much later on. This was before his appearance in on the school syllabus, <clears throat> and which John rightly described as kind of electrifying. Um, I, I, that library was in Thomas Street in the heart of Old Dublin, um, <clears throat> a library I was later to learn that Poet himself had frequented as, as, a, as a youth. Um, it was also a library, as was my school, both of them were stones throw from all those established personal places that he maps out and pays joycey and attention to in his poems, the family or places of family origin, the streets, the shops, the houses, and indeed even the smells <clears throat> evoking scenes from his childhood, um, all overshadowed, of course, by the great local citadel, um, which to our fathers and grandfathers played a part in both our lives the Guinness uh, Bury, uh, Brewery. Um, the poem that made the greatest impression on me then was Dick King. And I've said this before, it, because it was evoking scenes set right outside the library window. Um, and that for me was an electrifying experience. And of course, I suppose closest to my own heart are, are those Dublin poems. The poem I've chosen to read uh, is a Dublin poem, but it doesn't actually name place as he does so often in his poems. But I've, when I first came upon it, first night from um, one, of the, one of those last uh, pepper canisters, marginal economy, um, when I first came upon it, I thought of it as a companion poem to that magisterial Baker Street deserter. Um, and in this poem, Tom does what he has so often done, revisiting place, taking us back. And in this instance, it's to where the young poet first broke away from his working class roots, um, where he also formed vital artistic friendships. And, and we know from the familiar, the most important relationship in his life uh, began there with Eleanor Walsh. And it does return us in, in a way to that masterful dramatization uh, of the young poet coming to terms with his artistic self in Baggett Street Deserta. Um, there's a 50 year gap between the two poems, I think, <clears throat> uh, but there are familiar scenes, the attic room under the roof, the nocturnal window giving you a view of both an urban and psychic uh, landscape. Um, I think Douglas Dunn described Baggett Street Deserta as a poem of late night fatigue um, there is a sense of some excitement, I, 
in in the the mood of first night um, uh, um, in a sense a more convivial or engagement with the world beyond that window in Baggett Street. And um, there are other familiar ground notes in the poem. Uh, it's, a, it's got biographical detail. Um, the, poem, the poet is alert to his surroundings, what he called his local watchfulness. Uh, and contained in just a few lines of the poem is, the, is a hint of the disillusionment and the disappointment uh, with the post-independent state that we associate with the longer poems. Night Walk or a Country Walk and other poems, but more subtly contained here, and I think communicated indirectly through the voice of, of, of the, the barfly, the old veteran um, who Tom uh, e eavesdrops on um, when the old veteran say, talks about talking, or, or Tom in the poem points to the old veteran talking in his corner about the early days and the way everything went wrong. So, first night. The older people in the neighborhood knew him and stayed clear. Before they found themselves laid hold of again against the counter. Talking in his corner about the early days and the way everything went wrong refusing to take in the realities of the past 40 years. The long sentence, sentences finding their way to a legalistic close. But there was no one left who had known all the major figures. And I had learned to stand near in case there was something he hadn't said before. And sometimes there was someone new starting to listen, as I was that first night. I had moved into the flat across the street, a naked room up under the roof, with a thin bed, the widow's voices calling across the landing below. And taking my first look in the dead moonlight across the old roofs, back toward the edge of the city, the new slum I had just left, her teeth and glasses distinct on the night street. Our voices, unforgiving, exchanging refusals. My brain at the window, absorbing a new view of the world. City loneliness, one footstep down at the corner, I saw the lights of the bar opposite, checked I had enough left for a drink, and was counting out the change and turning away when I felt his presence beside me at the counter on his high stool, his back against the partition. After a few remarks, exchanged as though I had been gone only a while, he started talking. And now I'll hand you on to Mary O'Malley. Hello. Um, I'm Mary O'Malley and I'm a poet and I publish with Carcanet. Uh, I'll just start by making a couple of personal remarks as well. As, uh, like John McAuliffe, uh, Thomas Kinsler has been enormously important to me as um, one of the one of the the central poets consistently through my writing life. Um, it was Ivan Boland. I've met him a few times only, and the first time was when Ivan Boland introduced me to him very briefly at his seventieth birthday uh, celebration in the Abbey. I think it was. Um, I think he was uh, initially. I was impressed and um, with um, his Undunera, the poems of the dispossessed, his translations and versions, his introduction, his grasp of a very wide range and the of Irish poetry and the relationship of that to the current canon, the, his, his absolute clarity that the canon of the English poetry in Ireland was um, sat on a bedrock of Irish poetry and the two were almost 
um, inextricable one from the other, really, which is coming from my particular background, a uh, generation away from the Irish language in Connemara. This was uh, very immediate to me because you almost felt you were writing in a language that wasn't yours to write in, really, and couldn't write in the language that was. And I felt that Kinsella grasped and gave me permission to, to, on, to write in, in, in English or to begin to try. But I was also um, looking, Ireland being an island, I was looking for a certain um, freedom and liberation in the poetry. And uh, I think um, Michael has said far more eloquently than I, than I can how Thomas Kensel moved with that extraordinary rigor and discipline and almost um, very musical discipline in some ways, I think, compositional uh, rigor into the, in his, out from the sort of tighter formal um, poetry of his early days, that Audenesque um, sweetness really um, of some of the early poems and beauty. Uh, to a challenging um, freer verse, but always disciplined. And um, in this particular collection, I, it's interesting for me, the thing that jumped out at me immediately was the immediacy of the war poems now. And must I think of anybody who reads them, that it had, uh, there was a new resonance, a very fresh, a great freshness to reading those poems now. And I was struck by the tension between that I hadn't, I had, I think, missed before, um, of the absolute savagery. The, on the one hand, the the pre presentation of wars in uh, with a great sense of order, and then the very quick descent into absolute savagery. Um, the other thing that strikes me reading this with this poem that I'm going to read, the instances from the Greek, where he commences with a, a very small section from 13 of the book 13 of the Iliad um, and moves on, uh, is his sense of fatalism or resignation or both as to the continuation of this extraordinary propensity to murder one another in droves human beings still seem to have. Um, I couldn't help being reminded when I read the second part of the, 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 the second in, the instance uh, of Zimborska's line, after every war, someone has to clean up. Um, thank you very much to John and Michael for inviting me to take part in this launch. It means a great deal to me, as, to, as did Thomas Kensler. Instances from the Greek. Two named Ajax fighting side by side, two eager straining bullocks red in sweat. Men of the first Ajax fought beside, Jax fought beside him when he tired. Men of the second settled behind, not relishing close combat, without the plumed helmets, spears or shields, believing in slings and bows of the twisted wool. These warriors from Locris, from the rear, sent sharp showers across the heroes' heads, causing great havoc. That was the turning point when the Trojans lost their fondness for the fray from the Iliad, Book 13. Other classic history texts survive, recording the use of order to the full in instigating and conducting wars. Two nation states contend before a third whose backing is at issue arguing from actions and reactions in the past. The auditors retire to judge the merits, returning with the enemy of choice in firm commitment. This at the point of cause, order maintained further into process. As when a pair of coastal states resolving at last on conflict, putting out to sea would bid their two fleets to form in line and hoist agreed signals, only then, when each was sure the other was prepared, with the ships bare down upon each other, ranked poles beating the salt surface in battle order to the point of contact. Then the confusion. Multiple collisions. The sailors leap from ship to ship, 
transformed, oars let fall and weapons seized in riot, coming against each other in the chaos, in various setting and predicaments, slaughtering each other as they meet. Action, lasting through the hours of light, slackening in the dusk, seizing at last by tired consensus, then the tidying, clearing the site, two sides by agreement, collecting their sodden bodies from the tide, the remaining ships homing across the wreckage. Groups of prisoners taken through the day put to death, part of the tidying, fact recorded without emphasis. There are records equally complete of orderly debate after the battle between the parties, one with the upper hand, the other having yielded on certain terms and finding these uncertain in the event, the flavour of hysteria in the air. The issues brought forward for discussion and negative pronouncement one by one, the persons deemed responsible brought out one by one in turn and put to death. And now I'm going to hand over to um, Andrew Fitzsimons. I'm sorry not to be Andrew Fitzsimons, but I, I think, Mary, that it's, I, I come next and then Andrew, I believe. Oh, I'm sorry, Michael. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. But anyway, thank you very much for your reading. Um, in the poem I've chosen um, is Elderly Craftsman at His Bench. It seems appropriate to read this on the final day of my third quartile, an elderly craftsman at his bench. Um, at my worn workbench, in my bent body, I am disturbed sometimes by an alien fantasy, always the same, the detail distinct. A soft arm reaching towards me, out of nowhere, the fingers closing and opening. I believe now that this is an appeal from serious efforts like my own, reaching unfulfilled from somewhere in the past, and have learned to put my words to one side, to relax, to think my way back into the depths beyond their origin, and to appeal to their source to call them back, tell them there is no peace here, and comfort them on their return. This restores a serviceable calm so that I can attend to my own work again, hoping there will be a like thoughtfulness for me and my concerns when the time comes. Now I hand on to our video, I think. Thank you. At times in, in his last work, he, 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 the poems sound like prayers. And one of the new poems that struck me most and moved me most is one that is the most prayerful, I think. And I, I think it's also one of the most tender things he, he, he ever wrote. So I'd like to end these few words by reading it. Beauty. The pale bare soul is the heart of a closed flower. In warmth and conscious tenderness, petal and petal unfolds. Thought and thought curls away and worm soft. The soul, which is life, is exposed. In its presence, that which is beautiful, which is also a closed flower, opens and exposes its soul. And its soul is the life of the everlasting spirit flowing from beyond through and beyond all things. Communion, pure is the sacrament. Okay, I think I'm up. Um, my name is Adrian Levy. I am delighted to be uh, participating in this event for Thomas Kinsella. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, a quick word, I first met uh, Tom and Eleanor Kinsella later in life in 2010 when I interviewed him in Dublin as part of my PhD research into his poetry and Tom and Eleanor were most kind to me and continued throughout the years when I visited them both in Dublin and in their home in Philadelphia. 
and um, we kept in touch. Uh, I published that interview in New Hibernia Review and I subsequently, he and I worked on a longer interview in 2019, I believe it's his last one, that published in Reading Ireland, a journal I edited and published and then was subsequently New Hibernia published it so it had a wider audience. Um, I am not to make a shameless plug, but I'm the editor of a book of essays on his work that will be published by Wake Forest University Press later this year, and I will then embark on Tom's authorised biography. Uh, the family have asked me to do that, and it was a great privilege, but I also have Jerry Smith and Jerry Daw to blame because they, they ganged up on me, basically. So um, I'm going to read from uh, the new collection, I'm delighted to see it in print, um, Night Elder, poem number 14. <clears throat> Night Elder. I was standing on the top landing, as I often do when retiring, looking out at the night. When there appeared in mid-air before me, a bare baby, male, passing, little head first. It turned toward me as it passed, an old man and was gone. I continued to my room, loneliness in my loins. And I chose this poem um, because I think, you know, the first, the five pepper canisters that, canisters that were originally published in late poems, collectively kind of, of course, they reflect a continuation and a self-reflection on many of Kinsa's early poems. And I think this poem, Night Elder, which is dated six months before the poet's death in December 22, 2021, is a continuation of this earlier work. And it demonstrates the kind of connective tissue that runs through many or much of Kinsler's poetry. Like for example, if you look at um, in Belief and Unbelief, uh, the pepper canister, first pepper canister collected in last poems, the poem legendary figures in old age envisages and are envisions a number of elders in intimate companionship, playing with all that remained of the barbed shafts of love. And you contrast these early, early elderly naked couples in their own shapes without shame with the solitary naked old man who appears to the poet in Night Elder. And like the vision in Night Elder, the poet is now solitary and alone, which he acknowledges in the final lines of this poem as he continues to his room with loneliness in his loins. And similarly, in fact, Master um, from 2011, another of the late pepper canister sequences, the poem which Michael read, uh, Elderly Craftsman at His Bench, finds the poet being disturbed sometimes by an alien fantasy, and which he describes as a soft arm reaching towards me out of nowhere. And this poem considers that fantasy to represent a creative presence reaching out to him from the past so too, the night elder who appears to the poet can be seen as another version of this aesthetic haunting. Also, I think in Night Elder, the poem's imagery of a bare baby floating in midair who transforms into an old man as he passes by the poet in the night sky typifies what Jerry Daw has classified or characterized as the unorthodox strains in much of Kinsella's work whereby he employs off-center imagery. And in another, I didn't mean this a shameless plug, but Jerry has an essay in our book where he analyzes the bat imagery uh, in the poem, Glenn, Mac Glenn McNass from Little Body. And for the bat in that poem is described by Kinsler as having a mouse body and is a little leather angel. And Jerry writes, in Kinsler's imagination, the bat belongs to a transgressive order of being not simply itself, but holding fast to that which is bizarre, unexpected, belonging to the invisible that lies beyond the rational conduct of everyday life and our ordinary workaday lives. And I think these comments are equally applicable to Night Elder and the eerie image of a floating baby who transforms into an old man before the old poet's eyes. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to hand over now to Jerry Daw. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be part of this launch of uh, Tom Kinsler's last poems. Uh, I'm delighted to be part of it. Um, I knew Tom uh, 
in the last 20, 25 years of his life with Eleanor. Uh, they were dear friends of my, myself and my wife, Dorothea. And uh, every, every summer we would hook up together either in Don Leary here or in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, Tom and I uh, shared a kind of background, uh, his Dublin, mine, Belfast, and I think we crossed over uh, and met somewhere in the middle. Um, my sense of Kinsella the poet uh, is very much from an academic point of view, it started off that way. I taught him uh, back in the 70s and 80s um, and then grew to appreciate more and more and more uh, his significance uh, on the, uh, the Irish poetic landscape, but also globally. Um, and last poems seems to me to encapsulate um, like a gloss uh, so much of uh, Kinsella's uh, achievement. The childhood, uh, the childhood landscapes are there, um, and the the signs of his upbringing in in Chicor are, are are inscribed in the book. But there's also something. Uh, I've only had this book a couple of weeks, so my responses are are fresh and and open. Uh, but there's something God haunted about the book. Uh, which struck me greatly. Um, the poems seem to live on the threshold uh, between life and another life. Uh, there's almost a kind of posthumous feel in the latter parts of the book inside the poems as Tom moved towards um, the, the end part of his, his life. Um, but running throughout this extraordinary achievement uh, uh, as a poet, uh, uh, I think there's a monk-like uh, feel to some of these poems of invocation, exhortation, um, fragments, um, as if he's revisiting his own past and making sure the account is clear. Uh, I also feel that Last Poems has a very powerful sense of um, his understanding of life, the order of things, uh, the order of living things, uh, and what he often referred to as the kind of struggle uh, to get things in, in place. But there was also something more, in a way, lighthearted that struck me, or, or more... Uh, uh, shall we say, historically uh, vicarious. I was quite taken by the fact that some of the latter poems refer to the National Student, the UCD magazine, in which he published uh, in the 1950s, 1951, 1952. And it did occur to me, having not known that, uh, that Tom Kinsler connects in with the inner history of Irish poetry uh, going back through UCD to a poet such as Charles Donnelly, who was only born uh, 14 years before Tom was. Um, and those poets, all of whom contributed to the national student, like Brian Coffey and Dennis Devlin, um, there is a kind of inner history there that may well be worth exploring in its own terms. But I also felt reading last poems, the extent to which Tom never got rid of the rage and um, uh, his uh, adjudication of what was happening around him in terms of uh, the cultural life of America, of Ireland uh, and, and, and indeed of Britain, uh, but the, the Anglo world um, seems to me to be, uh, something that he was always vigilant about. And the poem I'm going to read is um, on page 127. Uh, it's the 22nd of the sequence of um, the latter part of the book, the last poems written towards the end of his life. This one comes from August 2021, a matter of months before he passed on. 
Um, and I just, as Michael Schmidt mentioned earlier on, I mean, Tom's sense of English, uh, that it was a tool to be used politically as much as anything else, chimed, I think, with Donald Davey. Um, and there is a way in which uh, he uses a working class street game uh, as a way of actually moving into a political statement. Anyway, this is the poem, Street Game for Adults. Find the meanest pair of eyes, sharp with cunning, short and shame. Remove the normal human mind, substitute a swollen self, oversized but incomplete. Stand him on the mortal mark. Form a circle, throw the hatchet, run for cover if you catch it. Hide and seek, close your eyes and bare your necks. Say your prayers and start counting. And now I hand over to John McAuliffe. That's great, Jerry. And I, I brilliantly read that poem and really wonderful to hear everybody talking about the um, um, about the poems. Um, and that sense of rage that you mentioned, I think, as well, you know, that sense of that edge that's still there in the late poems, that sense of the need to get things down right is really, really brilliantly caught in what you had to say. Um, I'm going to finish tonight by um, reading one of the more glittering and I think unusual poems um, that's recovered in last poems. It's a poem called um, The Starlit Eye. And it was first published in 1952. And it was the first poem Thomas Kinsel had actually published at all with the Dalman Press. Um, and in one way, it fits in with a lot of the 1950s work, which, you know, many of us will have read Kinsella for first. It's got that formal um, stanzaic finish and it's got that lovely rolling syntax with the rhymes which runs over um, and runs across the stanzas. So there's a little bit of Auden um, kind of Auden's influence and the kind of um, what he admired in Auden's ability to mix together different kinds of myth and ordinary detail is there in the poem too. Um, but it's also a really daring poem and it's worth saying, I suppose, and again, following on a bit from what Jerry said, that Thomas Kinsella was never allergic to the idea that some subject matters are just powerful um, and that they draw us in as, as readers. And sex was certainly that when he wrote this um, poem in 1952, because at that time, censorship was really at its peak. It had increased sixfold over the previous decade in those years. Um, and it's what makes this poem's boldness and its frank sexiness, unlike anything else, I think, that's published in Irish poetry at the time or would be published for, um, for, for many years afterwards. And just to kind of uh, emphasize how um, uh, strange, novel and modern the poem was, the Dalman Press until this, its other publications, and, and these are things that Dalman and Thomas Kinsella's friend Liam Miller were publishing on a borrowed printing press, which they had gotten off of Blonid Salkeld, another poet. The other poems that they had published were by um, Sigerson Clifford, um, a book called Travelling Tinkers, which is kind of a folksy, um, enjoyable, but folksy, kind of a little bit stage Irish set of poems, and also a set of Christmas carols. And then this poem arrives um, from the Dalman Press, and it changes, it changes Dalman Press, and it changes Irish poetry. The starlit eye. The breathing sea in Dublin Bay is broad and dark this end of day. Under a chill and constant wind, she pours her tenuous waters in to rearrange with touch and whisper, shells and sand learning to lisp her sibilant rolling nom d'amour. The female creatures whose allure pointed out this time and place for my surrender turns her face smugly upward, her shining eye on me, but I regard Orion, spread eagled at a sharp degree, coldly emerging from the sea. That spare and frigid frame of stars 
and the minute particulars of this girl's patient, cool intent are not at one and scarcely meant to occupy me both together. I quickly put the question whether blood should be put down or the bright and starred eye be closed up tight before the judicial blink of a ship, before the wind and the waves that slip slyly up the sand and the boulders dim conspiratorial shoulders. Their silence is a deep response that clears away the doubt at once insinuating. Why imply that there is a dichotomy? Earthly strand and abstract ocean mingle both in soft commotion. Day still separate from night gathers in a fluid light. Suddenly she beside me seems the meeting place of various streams, converging in a placid mirror that reflects my simple error. After a primeval pause of caution, her first yielding thaws my taut reserve. Without alarm, the problem folds inside my arm and is resolved by lips and hand so that we can both understand. Night grows around our satisfaction till we tire. In quiet reaction, standing apart on the sands in soft mood, we talk and look aloft at glittering gravel in the sky to see Orion striding by, suspended, handsome, broad and high. So that's the first poem I, th I think that he published as in a standalone publication, and it feels like a, a suitable point to um, finish this publication um, of, of last poems. Um, again, a book we're very, very proud to be um, publishing um, here at Carcanet. Um, I'm going to call on um, Jazz, um, our MC, um, and maybe my fellow contributors to ask if they have any further um, questions or comments or thoughts um, for one another, one another um, before we finish up. So I'm not sure that I'm seeing anything in the in terms of the um, in terms of the, the notes in the chat. Jerry, could I maybe Jerry Smith, could I maybe bring you back in just to say a little bit more about your sense of how this manuscript of later poems was assembled and about how the materials um, of those early um, student poems kind of came back into his possession as something that he was interested in um, in returning to. Um, yeah, it well, first of all, I when you look at the, the last poems, I think you said published 2013, um, I from time to time asked Tom the question that we all ask each other, you know, are you writing? Have you written anything? And I, he, he was adamant that the work was complete. The poems were done. He was he had moved on to writing his commentaries, his prose commentaries. Um, he had he, he was reading Shakespeare, um, Eliot, and and some of those commentaries have been published. So when when new work started appearing, um, it was a surprise. It it was a very pleasant surprise. Um, and I think one of the, interestingly, um, the poem that Jerry Daw wrote, uh, or read, sorry, <laughs> Street Game for Adults, um, is dated in, in this edition, August 2021, not terribly long before he died, a couple of months. Um, but he, he gave me a version of that for the Irish Times several years prior to that, because um, a certain Donald Trump was still in power in the United States, and I, I do think, as 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 I think Adrian has pointed out in a in a in a blog for the Carcanet website, um, political events there prompted him. Um, I I think he was a key, he remained all his life a keen observer of what was happening. Um, and then other poems, uh, the choice was another one that that appeared. Um, now, Tom is the contention that he is a challenging poet uh, was not allayed by by some of the poems that were appearing. Um, I, I they'd brought to mind what I think Eamon Grennan once said about his work that you experience it before you actually understand it. Um, mm. So some of those short poems and the notion that of the continuity with the early work 
certainly stands. He was in, in various ways revisiting. Uh, the big surprise for me when when it eventually landed, I mean, he, he was, I wasn't aware on, until probably the last year of his life that he was actually doing a lot of work, revision work on, early, on those early poems. Um, and I, I think it was December 2021, 20, uh, one of the poems that you you have in the, in, in the last poems there, Christmas 1950. Yeah. Uh, I saw it and I, I was, it was a revelatory to me. I was blown away by it. But what struck me about it was this was the period when he was about to come under the influence of Auden. Um, those, um, you know, beautiful poems of poetic decorum. But I, I, I see Eliot in, in that particular poem, uh, Christmas 1950. Um, and I, I was really very, very taken with that. He told me, I think, too, that it was only the second poem he wrote, which, which, which further surprised me, astonished me, that it had not been published. It had not been published. Um, certainly had been published. I think the only other version of it was one in the archive in Emory. Um, and I think if I'm, we don't have Andy with us, who's, who, who's been thoroughly through that archive. I, maybe you have, John. Uh, I, I, I think the, um, the revision in that poem is the deletion of a final stanza. Mm -hmm. um, but the poems, the poems kept, you know, kept appearing, um, which, which was interesting. What, you, what, what, of course, we have really in that section of the book are the first and last poems, which makes it really interesting. A, a 70 year gap between beginning and end. Um, but the one thing that st strikes me, um, Mary referenced his rigor when it came to the language. That's there. And it's there in his approach to the, um, the revisions. Now, uh, there, are, there are a lot of people, um, I remember James Liddy writing to me one time um, and saying that he, he was just, it was after Tarkin had published um, The Collector. And I think it was the version of Old Harry. And, and he said he had, Tom had simply butchered the best bits out, out <laughs> of the poem. Um, but, you know, it, it, we, we know other poets, Derek Mahan constantly revised his work. Um, and the, I mean, the death and ilium, I, I, I was reading earlier today, there are very, very subtle changes in that poem. Um, and you'd, I, I would love the opportunity to go back to it and talk about yeah. some of the revisions that I now know he introduced into, in, into those poems, the early ones, and even the later ones. As I say, the, there's a difference between the poem, the version of Street Games and the Irish Times, and the one that was that, that's here in this this book. That's great, Jerry. Uh, incredibly, in, incredibly illuminating about it. And I think that sense of the continuities between the earliest poems and the latest poems is really quite amazing. Um, there's a question in the chat about about Dante, and um, thanks for that question. And I would say, you know, having spent quite a bit of time, that Dante is a close familiar of the figures because there are so many character studies here who are um, caught in their sin um, and are, are, are stuck there. And the observations are so, they, they be, these characters and these figures are, um, uh, are captured in a way that I think is his reading of Dante early on and the way that it got into downstream stayed with him, um, I think all, all through his writing life afterwards. And I think we're probably going to, Finish there, but I am going to read something else from I'm, I'm, Liam Keevney has pointed out that he, he has published some of these um, poems for Tom privately in small editions. And I think you alluded to that earlier as well, Jerry. Um, and then Hayden Murphy um, is who, who, who says um, that in 1992 in the Herald in Glasgow, he declared him the most significant of European writers since the death of Beckett and can still live with that, um, which is a lovely thought. Um, at the end of um, at the end of this event, we're obviously very sorry that we're um, that it's going to be the 
the last of these individual collections that Karkinet will be um, publishing um, by Thomas Kinsler. Um, but we're delighted with the book. Um, I think it's going to delight all of its readers. And of course, we'll be um, coming back um, to Thomas Kinsler for many years to come as readers and writers um, and as publishers um, of new collected poems and going back to the translations as well. And of course, we got um, news hot off the press tonight as well about a biography that Adrienne will be um, will be writing and that will be in the works and which we will have to be keeping an eye out for as well. Um, so for now, I'm going to hand back to um, Jazz, who is going to take over and close things out for the night. But thanks very much to Adrienne, to Jerry Smith, to Mary O'Malley, um, to Jerry Daw, and to Michael, of course, as well, um, for reading the poems tonight. Thank you, John. Um, and I just want to reiterate thanks to you guys again. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Um, it's been really nice to see your messages coming in. Oh, there are still lovely messages coming in the chat. Um, thank you so much for all being here. Um, and like I said earlier, thank you for paying that two pounds. We do really, really, really appreciate that. Um, I'm putting the link in the chat for you to buy your book. Um, you can go and use the discount code on the website. Um, it'll come as an email tomorrow as well. So if you can't do it right now, don't worry. Um, it should come into your inbox. If you have any problems accessing the book or using the discount code, just give us an email um, and we'll be able to help you get a copy um, as soon as we can. So um, please join us next time. That's the only thing left for me to say. <laughs> um, the next launch is next week. We're launching the second collection by Laura Scott. Um, she's an incredible poet. Her first collection won the Seamus Heaney Award when it came out. Um, so please do sign up. I'm putting that in the chat for you as well. Um, her book was actually just chosen as Poetry Book of the Month in the Telegraph last night. Um, so um, please sign up for the launch and buy that book too. Um, so that's everything. <laughs> um, I'm going to leave the chat open for a couple more minutes just to get your last messages coming in if you're still typing them up. Um, but thanks again to all our readers um, and thanks to John and Michael um, and thanks to you guys. Good night. <laughs>